I'll be talking about edtech, which is a fancy word for e-learning. But before I go all nerdy and techy on you, let me start you off with a story. It's a tale of two brothers, Alex and Will, who grew up together in 18th century Prussia with a very ambitious mom. Maybe some of you can relate. And their mom wanted them to become a lawyer or an economist at the royal Prussian court. And for Will, that was fine because he was the intellectual of the two. But for Alex, not that much. He was more of a practical, hands-on guy. He loved to be outside and watch birds and do weird experiments in his dad's garage. He didn't want to hear about ancient Greek or law or philosophy. His mom didn't let him off the hook, though. She forced him to learn. She beat him. She made him take the best private tutors. And for years and years, Alex suffered through an education that had no practical value to him. So as soon as his mom died, he jumped on the first ship to South America just to get as far away as humanly possible from that, that dreaded place of his childhood. 20 years later, we meet Will again, and his mom's plan worked out. He's a lawyer at the Prussian court, and he's known as Wilhelm von Humboldt, one of the greatest minds in education that this country has ever produced. He's tasked by the royal Prussian king to redefine the Prussian educational system. And he remembers his little brother, Alex, who you might have guessed it, is Alexander von Humboldt, the natural scientist that has given us so much information about biology, chemistry, and physics. So William remembers how difficult it was for Alex to study things that he's not interested in. And he redes redesigns the German educational system to have a gymnasium, which is for intellectuals like himself, teaching ancient languages, law, and philosophy, a Realschule, which is real school, which is the school for people who are interested in real stuff, applied sciences, biology, chemistry, <laughs> which assumes that what we learn isn't real, but I'll leave it at that. And last but not least, main school, Hauptschule, which is meant for the broad populace, which at William von Humboldt's time didn't require schooling beyond five years. <coughs> Until today, this is how we school kids in Germany. We have these three schools. And the amazing thing about this idea was that it was the first time we individualized education. It was the first time we customized what we teach to the person who learns. And today, we can take this one step further. We are able to customize what you learn, not only to who you are, but to when and how and where you want to learn. Example, you're all here in the same room at the same time, listening to the same person in the same language, in the same speed, in the same content. This is boring. If some of you had known the story of Wilhelm and Alexander, you could have fast forwarded it and gotten to the interesting technical stuff. If some of you didn't get me because I'm a fast speaker, you could sort of go back and find out what was that in the middle. And if some of you don't like listening to talks at 5 p.m., why not listen to it at 10 p.m.? Or if you're an early bird person, which I will never understand, listen to it at 8 a.m. You're free to do that. This is what we can do today. I want to take you into the future. 20 years from now, what will we be able to do? The problem with the approach today is that it requires you to be proactive. So you need to know what you want to learn. You need to know from whom you want to learn it. You need to know, for example, that Rod's a much more experienced talker, so you might better li listen to him. Also, he knows more about analytics, so if you're interested in learning analytics, listen to Rod instead. You might need to know the talker. If you're five years old, that's hard to do. So in 20 years, an algorithm will help you find the right kind of content for your strengths. It will not only measure your fortes, so what you're good at, it will also measure your biorhythm. Example, if this algorithm had met 10-year-old Anita, he would have found out that she's useless before 10 a.m. because she's mentally asleep. She wakes up around noon, and she's at her brightest at 4 p.m. That's when she's really good. Also, languages are cool. She likes German and English. She sucks at math. And she's fairly good at biology and physics. Chemistry is hard. So he would have designed a program for me which starts me off with English and German because that's easy and I can do it half asleep. Also, it gives me a feeling of success because I rock this. Around noon, he would start me off with biology and chemistry. Things would get harder. And at 4 p.m., when I'm at my best, we encounter math. But until then, I am A, at my best and at my high spirit time, and B, I am pumped from all the success events that I had 
early on. I feel like I'm the king of the world and I can master this. So I have a much better chance at succeeding. Also, I will have a panic button at the right bottom end of my laptop, or until then touchpad, and I can call Niels to help me whenever I fail at math. <laughs> Furthermore, the algorithm would pair me off with people who have strengths in the subjects that I'm weak in. So for example, in physics, he might pair me off with Mr. Strothatte, who has studied this and is good in physics. And in return, he could suggest to Mr. Strothatte to come to me when it comes to German lessons, because this is my mother tongue. This does sound cool, and it does sound creepy, because this algorithm will have data on me that might get dangerous later on. For example, if my employer had known about my math weaknesses, they would have never let me touch the budget. <laughs> now they know. <laughs> so uh, I'm looking forward to next year. But they know because I have made an informed decision to share this information. And this is why I don't like the term data protection. It makes me feel like I need to create this sort of Fort Knox around my data. I don't. I just need to be enabled to make an informed decision about when and with whom to share the data that I've created. This will be important not only with online education, but with anything you do online. But with education, it will be especially crucial because we share information that can determine a career or a life. Secondly, we need to make sure that algorithm covers social interaction because I needn't tell you that the true moments of learning don't come from getting the facts right. It comes from interaction. It comes from events like these, where we really physically connect to each other and share ideas beyond anything that an algorithm can provide us with. So we need to make sure that whatever we teach our children gives them the opportunity to learn social interaction. Otherwise, we will be teaching little autistic kids. Third, we need to make sure that the algorithm can be overridden. If I'm a genius, just assume this for a moment, I know it's hard to do, but if I'm a genius, and the algorithm just doesn't get me, there needs to be a human person that can judge whether it's the algorithm's fault or whether I need to be adapted. And that must be feasible if I'm above the algorithm and if I'm below the algorithm. So if we make sure that these three things are ensured, data management, not protection, social interaction, and data overridence, there is nothing we can do. So why am I standing here being passionate about something that sounds so creepily like Orwell's 1984? I can hear my pulse racing in my ears, I'm so nervous. Why am I still on stage talking to you? Because I believe that we have a third chance at revolutionizing education. We have a chance to grant access to people who haven't been able to afford or enter a university before. Geographically, if you don't live close to university, think Africa. If you need to walk two hours to get to a below average school near you, that's not going to be productive. We can get schools and really good education to people who live too far away from universities to get there. And we can give university education to people who, unlike you, don't have 10,000 euros per semester to be here. We can give education to people who can't afford it because we won't, be a, we won't have to finance an entire campus. So education will become cheaper. Third, and this is a problem in Germany, we won't have to measure social background because you might be afraid to enter university due to your non-academic background if you're here physically, but in front of your laptop, no one knows. So people might enter university regardless of their background. And will it be hard? Yes. Will it take time? Loads and loads and loads of it and even more so at KLU. Will it take money? Yes. And we have to make sure that it is financially viable for the universities. But if we can find a single Alex out there and turn him into a von Humboldt, then I think the view is worth the climb. Thank you. Next year. Uh, <laughs> no, I hope we're getting there. We're currently working on a strategy to implement this. Um, it will take time and effort and money, but I think if not private universities, then who?
Okay, so this is more of a personal question. Attendance-wise, would that? How would you manage that? Would there be attendance? Like, I I think it's very important because we attend classes. You're pitching me. <laughs> you're pitching me against professors here. Um, no, I don't think there would be attendance because the other advantage of e-learning um, that I didn't talk about is the examination end. Mm -hmm. And with e-learning, we can do exams without having entered the course first because we can say, if you have learned this, no matter where, no matter if you've learned it from YouTube courses or if you have listened to one of the marvelous lectures of Professor Hime, we don't care. If you can read a balance sheet, you're good to go. And the examination will rely solely on you knowing it and not on where you have acquired the knowledge. Really good to know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much again. Welcome.